Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. You're yourself, and that's the best, the, the best feeling about this place. When you look at the sun in the daytime, the sun is 93 million miles away. That translates into 8 minutes, 20 seconds travel time. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. Far away is Jupiter. So Jupiter is about five times further from the sun than we are. So tonight it's about 46 light minutes away. And year after year it moves about one constellation through the sky as it orbits around the sun. So once you're familiar with the sky, it's not at all hard to find the planets because you'll remember where they were last year and the year before. Today we're going to visit a Charlottesville gem for astronomy lovers. Housing what used to be the largest telescope in the U.S., this UVA facility is an excellent destination for anyone interested in taking a peek at how scientists used to measure the distance to nearby stars. Join us as we visit McCormick Observatory. Come on! A little bit about the telescope that you're going to look through tonight. The telescope was the gift of uh, Leander McCormick, who is the brother of Cyrus McCormick. It was a very big deal when this telescope came to Charlottesville, and Ormond Stone began a research program here looking at comets, measuring their orbits, measuring the moons of Mars, and also looking at nebula. The primary thing that McCormick Observatory is famous for starts with our second director, Samuel Alfred Mitchell, in 1914, began a program here to measure the distances to nearby stars. At the speeds we can travel right now, getting to the nearest star is a 75,000-year journey. Ed, what is your role here at the observatory? So I'm the director of the education and public outreach program that we have in the astronomy department. And so UVA no longer uses this for its research, right? That's right. So we no longer use McCormick Observatory for research for a couple reasons. It's a small telescope by modern standards. There's a lot of light pollution from Charlottesville City, Albemarle County, and the university itself. The telescope wasn't really designed to hold the modern digital research cameras that are very big and very heavy. And the weather here in Charlottesville just isn't very good. We don't get nearly as many clear nights as we do at the major observatories in the desert southwest. Yeah, and so the astronomy department is still running full speed ahead and using all high-tech gear and equipment, and now this space is open to the public. That's right. We have access to observatories in Arizona and New Mexico and even access to observatories down in Chile for doing our research. And so now we make McCormick Observatory available for education purposes and outreach purposes. So when is it open? McCormick Observatory is open to the public on the first and third Fridays of every month year round. We're also open to educational groups on the second and fourth Fridays of every month and they have to call the astronomy department to make advance reservations. But the general public for the Fridays, you just show up. That's right. If it's a clear night between 9 and 11 p.m., you can just show up at any time, no prior reservations, no tickets required, and then you can look through the telescopes. And if it's a cloudy night, we have other programs that go on on cloudy evenings. So today I'll be talking about the structure of the universe. The universe starts from a big bang, it's a big explosion, and then for many elementary particles, up at about 100 million light years, the first star just formed. So it takes a little time to prepare the space, the dome, for guests, right? What, walk us through, what do you do? So on a typical night, when it comes time to open up the observatory, the first thing that I'll do when I come in is open up the three doors that are in the dome here. It's a bit of an unusual design. Instead of one large door, we have three smaller ones. But we open up all three doors to equalize the temperature inside and outside the dome. Why is that so important? So if you've ever looked at us at, at over a parking lot on a hot summer day and you've seen the heat rising off the parking lot, you notice that everything behind it is shimmering and moving around and waving. And that's because the hot air is less dense than the cooler air and it bends light less. The same thing happens here at the observatory. If we were to heat the inside of the dome in the wintertime, when we open these doors, as the heat rushed out in front of the telescope, it would cause all the stars to look blurry and distorted. So we have to keep the inside of the dome the same temperature as the outside of the dome. 
Right, okay. So you have the windows open, and then what, what else has to be set up? The primary thing after that is to bring the telescope down to the ground to get that ready. And as we bring the telescope down, we'll put an eyepiece in the bottom. An eyepiece is what allows people to actually look through the telescope and see objects. Is that what you used? That's right. Can you show me so how to, you would bring it down? Sure, to bring the telescope down. Today, uh, back in 1885, the telescope was operated with ropes and pulleys. In the 1960s, they added electric motors to it. And so today, we can just bring the telescope down with a motor. Oh, that's great. And even though we bring the telescope down with motors, when we're pointing the telescope, we still do it by hand. Even though the telescope weighs a few thousand pounds, you can grab the telescope and you can still move it, and we still point it by hand, uh, just by grabbing it and moving it. And sometimes you have it positioned so that guests actually have to stand on ladders, these ladders to peek through. That's right. Depending on the object that we're looking at, if we're looking at an object that's very low in the sky, then the back end of the telescope is very high off the ground. So we have a small ladder and a much larger ladder that guests might have to climb all the way up to get a good view through the telescope. This telescope had just been finished at the factory in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when word came that its twin telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory had discovered the two moons of Mars, and they were able to use this telescope before it even left Cambridge to confirm the discovery of the two moons of Mars. Now, hang on for just a second. I'm going to rotate around and use that dome slit instead of this one because the telescope's staring at the inside of the dome there. How did they use the telescope back then, and, and, and how did they measure the distances to nearby stars? Astronomers measure the distances to nearby stars in the same way that you and I measure distances to things. We have binocular vision, two eyes on the front of our heads, because when I look at my finger with my right eye, I see it against one background, and with my left eye, I see it against another background. And if I blink my eyes, my finger appears to jump back and forth, not because my finger's moving, but because I'm seeing it from two different perspectives. Right. And that's how you and I judge distances to things. In astronomy, we do it by taking advantage of the fact that the Earth is orbiting around the sun. When the Earth is on one side of the sun and we look at a nearby star, it's against that background. But six months later, when the Earth is over here and we look at the same star, it seems to have shifted in the sky. Not because the star has shifted, but because the Earth has shifted over. And the size of that shift allows us to measure the distance to the star. But it's also moving through the sky because all the stars are orbiting around the Milky Way galaxy. Uh -huh. So typically what you do is you would take five to ten photographs of it now, and then six months later you would do five to ten more, and then six months after that do it again, and six months after that. And for many, many years, every six months you'd be photographing the star multiple times. You would end up with hundreds of photographs of the star that now have to be carefully measured. And the, the photographs are actually glass plates. That's right. So the photographs that we took here at McCormick Observatory are five by seven inch glass plates. The reason we use glass is, first of all, the program began in 1914 when there was only glass plates. But in addition, glass is dimensionally stable. That is, if we take an image of the stars and we measure it now, or we measure it 20 years from now, we should get the same results. When plastic film came out, astronomers did not adopt plastic film very often because plastic film can bend and twist. Right. And 20 years from now, if you took a photograph of the stars and the stars appeared to move, you would wonder, are the stars moving or is it the, the photograph that's bending and twisting? How many plates do you have in storage here? So over the years from 1914 till the parallax program ended, we, we gathered a total of about 144,000 plates here at McCormick Observatory. And so what, what do you do with those now? So the plates now are in storage in case anyone needs to use them. They're stored here at McCormick Observatory, and we're working very hard to preserve them for future generations. Right. Uh, I think a really interesting thing about these plates is this, for example, is a picture of a nearby star taken in 1969. We'll never be able to go back and photograph that part of the sky in 1969 again. We can right. photograph it today, but that might be the only record we have of that part of the sky in that year. To give you an idea of how much of the universe we've explored, the closest star other than our sun is called Alpha Centauri, and Alpha Centauri in light travel time is 4.4 light years away. It's 4.4 years travel time. Don't you have the largest collection of machines 
that measure, measuring machines? We think we have one of the largest collections of measuring engines in the country, starting with the earliest ones that we got here in the early part of the 20th century. And then every decade or so, the astronomers would upgrade to a better machine as the technology got better. And fortunately, here at McCormick Observatory, they didn't throw anything away. So we have all of the old machines in addition to the modern one. And you even have a desk area that remains completely untouched. It looks exactly as it did in 94. That's right. When, when the program ended. Yeah. And nothing has moved. And so it, when the parallax program was going on here, we would have astronomers or, or typically graduate students in the later years coming up and taking many photographic plates every night, night after night, every time the sky was clear. And then we had an astronomer down in the astronomy department who managed that program, determined which stars would go, the, the, the students would observe that night. Then when the plates would come in, the plates had to be developed. They then had to be graded as to whether they were good or bad, whether they could be used for science or not. And that whole desk where they did all of that sorting and grading still sits as it was in 1994. You also have another building, a little, a small building right beside the observatory, and you have two additional telescopes. Tell me about that. So we call it the student observatory or the doghouse because it looks like Snoopy's doghouse with a roof that rolls off. And that's both used in training our students and it's open on public nights. In there we have a 14 inch modern computer control telescope. And we also have an antique six inch telescope that was gifted to the university in the early 20th century. So on a clear night, you have the opportunity to look through the big telescope, and then you also have the opportunity to look through the two smaller telescopes and see a presentation, usually by a faculty member. And then you have museum spaces. You have two museum spaces. Talk about those. So we have a, a museum space that talks about a little bit about the history of the observatory. It has some artifacts from the early years, and it has some artifacts from the McCormick family who donated the telescope to the university. And then we also have two other areas with light boxes that highlight research that's going on in the department today. So right now, for example, we have a Saturn exhibit up because one of our scientists, Ann Verbisher, is working on the Cassini mission to Saturn. She's one of the principal scientists working on that mission. And she got us a number of images that were taken by Cassini in orbit around Saturn. And there's, there is one other thing that goes on here. You have, you have a weather station and it's, it's one of the only weather stations in Virginia, I think, where the weather is checked every day. That's right. So we have a National Weather Service weather station here, and it's the oldest, I believe it's the oldest continually operated weather station in Virginia. We have weather records going back to the 1880s, and they've been measured here every day. We have someone that lives in a house up here next to the observatory, and every morning at 8 o'clock, he get, comes over to the, the, to the weather station and manually reads the two measurements in there, the high and the low for the day before, and also checks the rain gauge. And you will often hear on the local news that a new record was set in Charlottesville, and that record is, is usually taken here at McCormick Observatory. It's oh, fantastic. Well, Ed, thank you so much. Okay, if I can have everyone's attention for a second. Jupiter is getting lower and lower on us, so the bad news is we're not going to look at Jupiter. The good news is Saturn's getting higher and higher, so I'm going to switch over to Saturn. Um, but what that means is I'm going to bring the telescope down and up, and I have to bring that big chair over. So everybody in the dome stand over there in the empty space for a few minutes, and then I'm going to move the telescope as well. Hey, yo, we're not here. By the SOL, we here to teach you to express yourself like that. Trying to get me all stuck in the zone. I'm trying to understand how I rock the microphone. I don't Today we're going to learn about a high school program that functions as a recording studio and creative hub where students of all interests and backgrounds work together to create music and art. Join us as we visit Albemarle High School's A3 house. Come on. The elastic. Check. Check. We aren't the same anymore. It was fun while it lasted. Our time together was so fantastic. The mission here at A3 House is to help students identify who they are and to pursue their passion by creating a vision to serve um, a purpose. In a broader sense, I think the vision is to take this model and solidify it and make it a permanent fixture in this school and also to plant it in other schools in this county, in the state, and across the nation. And that's not tongue-in-cheek. Like, I really honestly believe that we can um, 
make this a part of every school because it's that effective in helping students um, reach their uh, their purpose and identity. And you, you've spoken in the past about the importance of authentic experience as part of why you teach the way you teach. Talk about that. Well, when I was in school, I always felt like there was no authenticity. I felt like every time I was given an assignment or a test, it was always like trying to uh, almost trick me into learning something, almost like a gimmick, like, hey, let's throw some hip hop on top of this chemistry uh, project. It takes the authenticity away because it needs to be centered on what that individual student is interested in in actual reality for them personally and not trying to use it to get them to buy into something else, using it to get them to buy into themselves. So Bernard, give me examples of how you're doing that in the classroom. Uh, so for instance, uh, we created a record label model which basically gave every student a role and a goal. So me and Mr. Dickerson sat down and we went through all the students and said, okay, what, we, what have we observed about, say for instance, Anija? You know, what is she interested in? What is she really good at? And so we set, I, say, I like to say, we set them up for success. You know, we say, okay, you're good at this, you do this a lot, so why don't we just create the project around that so when you engage that project, you feel a sense of confidence, self-worth that says, hey, I, I pretty much destroyed this project, you know? <laughs> they pretty much tailor-made it for me and I feel really good about it. So part of it is kind of for our own benefit. It's like, hey, if I can get the ball rolling and you just go, I don't, you know, I don't have to like keep after you. So create autonomy within students by allowing them to self-engage. Go with Nyjah! My voice is out, she's a warrior, a fighter, and a survivor. It's just roam free, do what you want ask for help if you need it, and then other than that, you're just set free. And I like it because it's like, it's unique. It's not like your normal talk class. Having a hip hop uh, tournament at my school is really it's amazing and it's exciting because I, feel, I think we're like the first school in uh, Charlottesville that has this thing going on and it's, it's just really cool. My favorite part of being in this class is probably Mr. Dickerson. He's, he's a great teacher. You just you learn more than technology in here because I've learned so much from him that's not have anything to do with technology and uh, he's like my role model. So you like to collaborate within genres within the arts, and so the students work on projects all year long. Sometimes they collaborate outside of the classroom with other classrooms. Talk about that. Well, I think the, the great thing with the record label model, now that you know, oh, I have a graphic designer over here and a videographer in that class, I need a music video. So it, it created a natural context for people to be able to work together because now you're aware of these other talents that are available to you. I always wanted it to be a program that was uh, open to all forms of creativity, painting, photography, music, you know, like, dance, any, any creative art form it was open to that art form. And then when it became accredited classes, there was like this pressure that was applied that was like, um, oh, it's a class now. It needs to be uh, taken seriously. So we have to uh, create this curriculum where it's like you learn how to record on the microphone day one, and then you learn how to use a MIDI controller, and then you learn how to apply audio effects. So it like had this like rigidness. But then it was like, we have so many different talents. Why not? create uh, a record label because that's something that's familiar and I think that is the, the structure that it needed but then you still uh, could have them pursuing their personal passions and their talents without the rigid test taking and assignments and all that teacher stuff. Life is neither happy nor sad in fact. So as the teachers, as the instructors, what are your roles at the label? Well, we're not teachers. I mean, we are teachers. But what but are you we, at the label? I'm, actually, I'm the chief creative officer. Okay. I'm the director of vision and dreaming. Uh, <laughs> and our other uh, cohort was Mr. P. He was the chief, no, primary instigator. Primary instigator. Um, Tell, say his full name, though, so everybody knows who we're talking about. Trevor Przeski. Thank you, who's also a, a teacher here. <laughs> he's, a te he's been a teacher here for a while, like yeah. doing TV production. Yeah, and right. He was an inspiration to me last year because I was seeing how he was working with his film kids. And I was like, OK, so. Is there some uh, advantage to sort of putting kids in a work environment? Yeah. Them allowing them to still have fun and yeah. play? Everybody just wait. Yeah. Yeah. Because label, it's like really enjoyable for all the students because we all 
most of us want record deals when we grow up so having like something here just like for that it just feels you know good we have a lot of collaboration other like people don't know something other people come in to help and they learn stuff in the process it's like kind of like a family like we all come in here like we collab on stuff like it's cool yeah, I am the first person to come to A3 House. I mean, that's just the work I put in, the effort, I, the, how much I love music. That, that's, what, that's why I'm the first one to come in, you know. Just recently, you all had a huge showcase of everything that the label's been working on at Ix Art Park. Talk about that. I think the showcase worked out the way it did because we did have so much authentic buy-in from the members of the record label. And we had tried showcases in the past, but it was more of this like talent show format. But we really wanted to create this environment that was more like a festival where you could move around and go to different places and see different things and explore different art and touch and move and hear and eat yeah. and experience, like have an immersive experience. And also it was, a, it was reflective of how we teach the class because the, the, uh, the visitors at the showcase they were not required to be at any one place at any one time. They weren't required to, to listen to anything. They could roam freely and pursue their interests as observers. And like he says festival, I, I forgot this was a school event. And it made me just have this new vision for like we're saying education. I was like, why isn't education festive? Why isn't it people setting up tables and making beats and showing crafts and performing and you're learning through doing? A3 House is where the magic happened. <laughs> All the music cooking is where it happens. It makes school fun. I get a grade for doing something I love, and I don't think I could see myself doing anything else. So it's a good feeling. When I learn how to produce, how to record, and how to make music, I learned that the certain steps you have to take are not something that can be taught, but something that has to be experienced. Not every setting is the same, and each song is a new lesson to be learned from the last one. When the students are creating in the classroom, what are the rules? You know, so if you're dealing with songwriting, if you're dealing with hip hop, is there censorship, no censorship? How do you deal with that with teenagers? All right, so we have something in place. Um, it's sort of our, our charter. It's called AMP. And it stands for Authentic Artistry, Meaningfulness, and Polished Production. And so with AMP, uh, students are encouraged to produce uh, art that is from them and, a, and, and is a true authentic representation of who they are or where they are in life. And so the idea is not to uh, censor or I wouldn't even call them rules. It's not like a rule like you can't do this, uh -huh. but it's just like a reminder. It's a guide to say if you are doing something, if you are making some music or making poetry or painting, Remember, like, is this from your identity? Are you representing yourself? Are you representing someone else's experience? And so this space is actually designed to create um, a safe environment to put yourself out there, but they're also uh, building that security to uh, withstand criticism, to withstand um, people talking about it, to withstand cameras. And so it's about building security in your identity. So all year I've just been trying to at least make one song that I like really enjoy and like because I make a lot of music and it's just like, no. So that's what I've been trying to do is maybe like make an EP so I could like put it out on SoundCloud. We're just making songs. We're just writing and just working hard every day and asking him for help. Mr. H, y'all might know him already. So yeah, he's always on me. So yeah, just learning every day. I feel like if I don't have anything hands on, it's like I never really learn anything. So now I know how to set up the microphones when I want to record. I know how to set up other people's microphones when they want to record, set up the headphones, set up the actual screens and everything. So I feel like it's important to do hands on work because if you don't, I feel like you don't really learn much. So what do you want your students to take with them? What is most important to you all that they take with them throughout the year and then when they go off into the big wide world. Got this from Bernard Hankins, identity. If you walk away from this program with identity, then I think that you can apply that understanding of yourself to almost any task, any challenge, any hurdle, um, any vision. You must know who you are, and I think that's what we're doing with, with kids. We're trying to show them, hey, like you are an individual. You have a very uniquely designed gift that you can use 
to do absolutely anything. And I think connected to that identity is the sense of self-worth. You know, the amount of skills doesn't matter if you don't have that, uh, what I call life confidence. Yeah. You, know, you have the day-to-day -day confidence, but you have the overall sense that I can do something in life. So I think when people just, you know, walk away, I mean, honestly, it's feeling loved. Like mm -hmm. these people thought about me and cared about me, feeling human, you know, feeling ultimately human, I think is what, if you were to sum it up, feel human. I run to this class. I'm like, I'm going to class. I'm happy. This is my happy place. This is where I want to be at for the rest of the day. A3 House is amazing. <laughs> Put it that way. A3 House is amazing. You even want to get up in the morning at 620 to walk to school just like me. So that's how fun it is. So. Hip hop was made from jazz and then jazz was created from the blues and blues was created from African drumming and so on and so on. So it's just seeing the evolution of music and referencing the past in order to make the future music is amazing to me. I'll turn the lights back on now, watching, watching. As the credits all roll down, crying, crying. You know we're playing to a full house, house. That's it for this week. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.